Um, I'm just going to do the boring housekeeping, so I'm not going to say anything remotely interesting, but it's still important, so listen. Um, basically, if the fire alarms go, we're not expecting a drill, so just follow the two lovely people in red T-shirts and they'll take you out to the safe space. Um, the other thing to say is this is the first of our Suffrage 18 events, and there should be some leaflets around. Um, if you want one, ask us and we can get one for you. Um, the other thing is that you've been given evaluation forms. Um, LSE Library have just started doing public events and we're really keen to know where you've come from, what you'd like to see in the future, and just get an idea of you know, basically who our audiences are. We have a book signing afterwards, um, and that's really it from me. So, um, so on behalf of LSE Library, uh, my name's Debbie, and I'd like, we'd like to welcome you all here. I'm going to now hand over to um, Anne Phillips to introduce Jane properly. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so uh, I'm Anne Phillips, I'm from the Government Department at LSE and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to what's the first in what's going to be a year-long series of events, lectures, exhibitions, activities uh, in order to, designed to uh, celebrate the centenary of the Representation of the People Act which, um, which didn't uh, unfortunately give men and women the vote on the same basis but did at least enfranchise a very significant number of women, women over 30, um, with a certain kind of property qualification as well. About 40% of women got the vote. Now, um, politicians at the time, and indeed uh, a number of historians since, uh, have liked to say that the suffrage campaign, the pre-war suffrage campaign, uh, was an irrelevancy in terms of why women were finally given the right to vote and have liked to dwell on the idea that um, women were given the vote uh, as a, a reward for their selfless contribution to the war effort. Um, so given that, I think, uh, ridiculous uh, claim, um, I'm particularly pleased that we're starting the events uh, with uh, the lecture by Jane Robinson, um, who's, been, uh, who's just today published uh, a book which is about the, um, the extraordinary pilgrimage that was organized by the, uh, by the suffrage campaign uh, as part of the, um, part of the movement in, in 1913. So Jane Robinson um, is, uh, is very well known a uh, social historian who specialized in uh, looking at kind of uh, aspects of social history very much from uh, through women's eyes, so that her, her numerous books have included uh, a book about uh, the first women uh, to fight for education, Blue Stockings, uh, a book about the history of the Women's Institute, A Force to be Reckoned With, uh, and her most recent one called uh, In the Family, with most recent before this one, called In the Family Way, which looks at um, uh, attitudes to uh, illegitimacy and experiences of illegitimacy. Um, from the period from the Great War to the swinging 60s. Um, so uh, Jane is going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, after which we'll have a similar length of time for question and answer discussion. And then at the end of the session, um, uh, for those of you who've become intrigued by the story that she's going to tell us, uh, it's possible to uh, purchase uh, a copy of the book, and they're, they're on the table here. So can I um, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Jane Robinson to give her talk on Hearts and Minds, the Suffragists' March on London. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, LSE, for hosting this. And I'd just like to say thank you to the Women's Library as well, which is at LSE, for all they do to further study into women's history. It is a fantastic resource, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, people are very kind, and when they realise that you're a writer, they always ask what you're working on at the minute. And for the past couple of years, my answer has been the same. I'm doing a book about the fight for the vote. And it's ready for the big centenary in 2018, I say excitedly. And I know what's going to happen as soon as I've said it. A succession of stock images will immediately spring to people's minds. In a whirl of green and white and violet, 
a group of determined-looking Edwardian women strides towards us, usually wearing sashes and top-heavy hats or the aprons and clogs of the factory floor. They carry placards, who would be free must strike the blow, for example, or maybe bricks and hammers. A few of them are being manhandled by policemen while others raise their fists in strident protest. Ethel Smythe's March of the Women is playing in the background. Or perhaps they picture a young prisoner with um, wild eyes and loose hair strapped down in her cell and being forcibly fed through a tube. Or Emily Wilding Davidson lying on the Epsom turf with her broken head wrapped in newspaper. Ah, oh, yes, everyone says. Votes for women. It's all about the suffragettes. Well, as you will know, it's slightly more complicated than that. Like all women in history, campaigners for the vote have suffered from overgeneralization. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the press and cartoonists caricatured them all as lunatic harridans. Here's just an example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. Two things about that. Firstly, being a suffragette didn't necessarily mean that you were an extremist. Victoria Lydiard was a proud follower of suffragette leader Emmeline Pankhurst, and she was a member of the Militant Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU, whose offices, incidentally, were feet away from where you are sitting now. But she would never have dreamt of going on hunger strike because her mother said she mustn't. And her colleague Grace Rowe was appalled at the bra-burning antics of the so-called women's libbers of the 1960s. She considered first wave feminism, the fight for the vote, to be something of a spiritual campaign. This didn't preclude violence, but it did at least lend it the gloss of evangelism. According to her, it was simply bad taste to show off. And secondly, the movement was not all about the suffragettes. Of course, they played a vital, vital part. And some lost their health, um, even their lives in defense of their beliefs. I've loved writing about them in the book, especially the lesser known names. But they were a minority, the ones who caught the headlines. And for good or ill, their confrontational approach distracted public attention from the imaginative and more quietly courageous work being done by tens of thousands of others across Britain, dressed not in amethyst and emerald, but in their own uniform of berry red and leaf green, not singing Ethel Smythe's anthem about battle and strife, but songs like Paris Jerusalem instead. They were the suffragists, the non-militant campaigners who were just as determined about emancipation as their suffragette sisters. And they're the people that I'm focusing on this evening, the heroines and heroes of hearts and minds, and the founders of this country's tradition of mass peaceful protest. And I'll start, if I may, with an extract from the beginning of the book. Marjorie Lees was off duty. Some of the others had cut along an alleyway leading from the recreation ground to the marketplace to hold another open air meeting. But Marjorie, Millie Field, Ida Sharples and Mary Siddle had done more than their bit yesterday and were stood down. It was a peaceful Monday evening in July 1913. The view of the Chiltern Hills was much gentler than the Lancashire fell Marjorie and her friends were used to. The air was soft, dusk was drawing in, and after two weeks on the road in their caravan, the women felt ready for a rest. They had left Oxford at 9.30 that morning in a strange procession of around 70 women, many of whom were unfashionably tanned, some carrying slightly grubby banners, several on bicycles and one even riding astride a horse, shockingly dressed in khaki trousers. The, the rider, that is, not the horse. <laughs> a, a few men marched with them, including an elderly fellow who had walked all the way from Carlisle, and a handful of Oxford undergraduates so entranced by this curious company of women that they had decided there and then to go with them to London. One of the lads was six foot seven inches tall, a useful attribute when scanning the crowds for trouble in the bad lands of the home counties. Everyone paused at Headington, 
a suburb of Oxford, for a group photograph to be taken with an elderly lady who, it was said, had signed that famous suffrage petition to Parliament way back in 1866. They arrived at the village of Wheatley, five miles down the road, at noon. The planned luncheon at the Merry Bells did not go entirely to plan. When the innkeeper saw how many there were of them, he blanched. He had only seven cutlets available and a few hard-boiled eggs. It was a little like the parable of the loaves and the fishes, but without the happy ending. He refused to cook them anything else, so many went hungry. But they were used to that by now. At least they weren't chased off the premises or pelted with rotten potatoes. Mrs. Vicar, at the next village, tried her best, but the open-air tea she had prepared didn't quite stretch far enough either. Still, she was apparently a doctor, as well as a clergy wife, and drove her own motor car. This was inspirational enough without tackling mass catering too. Now they had arrived at Tame, Marjorie could feel herself relaxing. This was a lovely spot. She and her friends sat mending their increasingly tattered linen and giggled about a picnic near Banbury a couple of days ago when Mrs Fletcher ate so much toasted cheese that her deck chair collapsed. Then someone dropped a plate of cakes on people's heads while trying to negotiate the steps of the Ark, which was their nickname for the caravan they travelled in. And Annie Davies sat on her hat after warning everyone else not to and flattened it. The weather was so fine in Tame that the groom, Scholes, pitched a tent on the recreation ground for Millie Field and Eda Sharples before leaving for a local inn with the horses. So they had no need to cram themselves into the ark tonight with Marjorie and Mary Siddle. It was eight o'clock. They could hear the faint sounds of people singing, not very well, and high-voiced rhetoric floating across from the town centre. All was well. There were three wooden caravans parked in Tame that night. Two belonged to the Oldham contingent, the Ark, drawn by a horse called Noah, and Sandwich, <laughs> drawn by Ham. And the third group was from Birkenhead, pulled along by Polly. The Ark's comforts were limited. The bunks were surrounded by tins of food, boxes of pamphlets, a change of clothes for everyone, spare hats, luckily, countless jars of marmalade, crockery, washing basins, books, fold-up furniture... Given the space available, it was a relief that two of the women would be sleeping outside tonight. They bade one another good night and were just beginning to get undressed when the tone of the music and speeches that they had been half aware of in the background began to change. They heard jeering and shouting, women screaming, someone blaring a hunting horn over and over. The noise grew louder and by now it was dark. Two voices approached the tent. A couple of breathless policemen had hurried from the marketplace to warn the women that trouble was on its way. The meeting had broken up in chaos and a gang of hooligans was making for the recreation ground. Millie and Ida immediately crept out of the tent and into the ark. Marjorie snuffed out the candles, barred the door of the caravan and barricaded the windows with cushions. The clamour of the crowd, hooting and shouting obscenities, swelled terrifyingly as the four women pushed themselves as far to the back of the vehicle as they could manage. It was difficult to know how many men were outside, certainly over a hundred. The noise went on for about 20 minutes, though to Marjorie it seemed much longer, and then began to die away. But the women were aware of different sounds now, the muttered oaths of men tripping over guy ropes, and a weird repeated rasping, which they realised with horror was the sound of matches being struck. The policemen had retreated, overwhelmed. The Oxford undergraduates were nowhere to be seen and Scholes, the groom, was probably nursing a well-earned pint in the spread eagle. Once alight, the ark would burn like tinder. How did these four respectable women find themselves in an Oxfordshire field in the last long summer before the Great War in fear of their lives. They were far from home at a time when few people strayed from their own corner of the country and ladies rarely travelled without a gentleman rather than just a man like the groom skulls to part the ways for them. Even though they were out on the streets accosting people every day just as common prostitutes did, they were hardly women of ill repute. They had abandoned their families and factories, professional commitments, domestic duties, deliberately to put themselves in danger, 
but were neither mad nor reckless. Yet here they were, at an unknown town, cowering from a mob of ordinary British citizens threatening to kill them. It was all for the sake of the vote. Marjorie and her companions were suffragists on a mission, taking part in one of the most successful and largest scale public demonstrations this country has ever known, the Great Pilgrimage of 1913. It was a six-week massed protest march, punctuated by hundreds of meetings like the one at Tame, and culminating in a rally in London's Hyde Park of some 50,000 people. This march changed lives, and I still don't quite know why we don't know more about it and why more people don't know about it. A hundred years on from the first women being able to vote in parliamentary elections in this country, the spirit of that march is still changing lives. More about the pilgrimage a little later. Meanwhile, I'll just briefly put Marjorie Lees and her companions into context a bit. Historians like to date the orchestrated campaign for female enfranchisement back to 1792, when Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women was published. But women were involved in activism long before that. In 1427, a group of women in London complained to the House of Commons about a husband's inhumane treatment of his wife. And the Levellers were early campaigners for universal suffrage for men, some of their female members wanted to extend that concept by lobbying Parliament for a vote themselves. And in 1649, 10,000 of them signed a petition for the right to represent their grievances to the government. It got nowhere, of course. In 1832, the Great Reform Act was passed by a Whig government wiping out rotten boroughs by creating new constituencies to even out the number of electors across the country and widening the franchise to include small landowners, tenant farmers, shopkeepers, all householders who lived in boroughs and owned their own properties or paid an annual rent of £10 or more were eligible to vote, unless disqualified on other grounds, being lunatics, criminals or women. And one of the first individual women's petitions to Parliament was presented in the wake of the Great Reform Act, on the 3rd of August, 1832, Hansard records its progress. The MP bringing it to the House of Commons, a Mr Hunt, suggested to members that they might enjoy listening to this one. He had been asked by a Mary Smith of Stanmore in Yorkshire, a lady of rank, to explain why she did not have a share in the election of a representative since she paid taxes. And since she was liable to all the punishments of the law, decided by a male judge and jury, why did she have no part in making the legislation? Someone in the House made the point that it would be rather awkward if juries were half male and half female. What would happen if they had to be locked up overnight? <laughs> this might lead to some embarrassment. Hunt replied, no doubt to guffaws from the floor, that he knew the honourable member was frequently in the company of ladies for whole nights, but wasn't aware of any ensuing mischief. Ho, ho, ho. The petition was then laid on the table. In other words, like all the others, it was thrown out. But now, once the precedent had been set of broadening the franchise just a little bit by the 1832 Act, a more concerted campaign for women's suffrage began to emerge with real hope of success. Not immediate success, perhaps, but a, a steady progression through the next few decades towards votes for women on the same terms as they were granted to men. Supporters were heartened by news of the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York State in 1848, when Americans Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Mary Ann McClintock kick-started the feminist movement in the United States. Their statement, which was based on the Declaration of Independence, averred their rights as, and I quote, one half the people of this country, not to be oppressed by men nor to remain entirely disenfranchised, but to be allowed to use their voices for the good of their country and of their souls. British suffragists agreed, of course, but the more they raised their voices, the louder brayed the opposition. 
According to anti-suffragists, women were not only intellectually incapable of meaningful political activity, they were physiologically and emotionally a mess. How could they be trusted to influence the government of the country? Just as the eminent Dr. Henry Maudsley claimed in 1874 that if women used their brains too much, their wombs would wither, so Sir Amroth Wright, who was another medic, wrote some 40 years later that, and I quote, no doctor can ever lose sight of the fact that the mind of woman is always threatened with danger from the reverberations of her physiological emergencies. There is mixed up in the women's movement, he warned gravely, much mental disorder. And by a woman's physiological emergencies, he meant, of course, her periods. According to Sir Amroth, peace would not ensue when a woman got the vote. On the contrary, it would only be achieved when she gave up, calmed down, accepted her natural disabilities, and stopped picking on men. In fact, when she ceased to resent the fact, and again I quote, that man cannot and does not wish to work side by side with her. In a diatribe that even at the time seemed extreme, Sir Amroth went on to state that only unfledged girls and the sexually embittered were likely to be moved in, uh, by arguments in favour of women's suffrage, that women didn't deserve the vote because they didn't earn enough money, and that they only wanted it in the first place because they were naturally jealous of men. Then he pulled out his trump card. The civilised world was fashioned by men, and therefore men should have sole use of it. It simply wouldn't be fair if women muscled in, now the job was done. It's a mistake to think that everyone opposed to giving women a vote thought in the same terms. The popular argument, with which I'm sure you're all familiar, was that women had their proper sphere, the home, and that their strengths were more spiritual than political. They could and should exercise influence solely through bringing up the family in piety and economy and by supporting their menfolk in all things. After all, everyone knows that behind every successful man there stands or sits a woman and it is better to possess a voter, so they say, than a vote. Be satisfied, dear ladies, with that. Before 1950, the scrolls on which petitions were presented to Parliament were routinely consigned to the furnace. A few have survived, but the most significant petition of all in the history of women's suffrage is sadly not among them. It was drawn up in haste in 1866 and included 1,521 signatures, ranging from the female celebrities of the day, there weren't many, like the scientist Mary Somerville and the writer Harriet Martineau, to Ellen Nichols, a governess from Hampshire, the divinely named Bathsheba Pillbeam, a former grocer, and charwoman Emma Tingle. This is a page of the printed copy. It's apparent that as well as being gentlewomen and career women, professionals or working women, the majority of the signatories on this petition were heads of household and would therefore be immediately eligible to use any vote granted to them on property qualification. Others were perhaps divorced, so had already benefited from the efforts of activists like Caroline Norton and Barbara Lee Smith Bodishan to change the law in favour of married women. In other words, within little more than a month, the petition committee managed to target their canvassing to present to Parliament an array of valid names across geographical and social divides. The implication was that these were not only supporters of the cause for women's suffrage in their own right, but representatives of all sorts of different classes of women suffragists, just as concerned with the material things of life as with the concept of respect, esteem and natural justice. The 1866 petition showed merely a cross-section of potential voters, so surely, surely a powerful message. The petition was delivered to MP John Stuart Mill by two pioneers, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, the first woman to qualify as a doctor in England, and Emily Davies, who founded the first women's university college in the country. Here they are, I can't help thinking a slightly ridiculous painting. They look as though they've just walked off the set of a low-budget costume drama. 
the thought of either of these strong-minded women wearing such gaudy frills and furbelows seems slightly inconceived to me, but the painting was done by a suffragette artist, so what do I know? Out of the committee behind the 1866 petition grew a number of women's suffrage societies across the British Isles, which eventually amalgamated into the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, the NUWSS, in 1897. At their head was Dr. Garrett Anderson's sister, Mrs. Millicent Fawcett. Individuals of some charisma began to take up the cause. Jessie Cragen was one of the Scottish campaign's most spirited evangelists. She was the daughter of a ship's captain and an Italian actress who had some experience of the theatre herself, and that experience shone through when from 1870 onwards she started travelling around the United Kingdom, holding meetings on such subjects as the rights and wrongs of women, keeping audiences in thrall with her booming voice and her huge stage presence. She must have covered thousands of miles with her dog Tiny, who was probably nothing of the sort, between Cornwall and Cape Wrath. She usually employed someone to march ahead of her, ringing a handbell as they went to grab people's attention, and then she would stride onto a makeshift platform, clamber perilously onto a chair, and begin the show. However they chose to go about persuading other people, most suffragists at this stage agreed on what was the point of women having a vote. It was not just a matter of natural justice. Women sought political influence to change things that had too long remained unchanged. Child poverty, sweated labour, the white slave trade, prostitution and trafficking, liquor laws, inadequate medical services, desperate working conditions, all these were scourges affecting women and urgently in need of reform. And when Marjorie Lees and her fellow pilgrims set out full of hope and excitement, somewhat in the spirit of Jessie Cragen, they were marching not just for the vote, but for a better world. Nothing much happened following the 1866 petition, apart from a certain amount of publicity and a failed bill in Parliament, drafted by a young high flyer called Richard Pankhurst. Attempting to navigate the legislation concerning women's suffrage is bewildering, believe me, because of all the private members' bills and amendments in various clauses repealed and reinstated and successive readings passed or failed, identifying the milestones along the hairpin bends en route to the vote is not easy. Dr Pankhurst's suffrage bill was lost on its second reading in the House of Commons in 1871. The subject was debated a total of 18 times between 1870 and 1904. On several occasions, further petitions were drawn up to back the suffragist argument. Over 186,000 signatures were submitted in 1871, nearly 328,000 in 1873. The strength of this campaign speaks volumes of the various suffrage societies' organisational skill, communication, and most of all, their persistence. I mentioned the NUWSS. It was a nationwide body which numbered some 600 branches and over 100,000 members at its height. At the time it was founded, everyone fighting for the vote was called a suffragist. A Daily Mail journalist writing on the 10th of January 1906 coined the term suffragette. It was meant to be disparaging, the diminutive suffix not only suggesting a frivolish, girlish attitude, but a sham, just as leatherette was sham leather Kashmirette was pretend Kashmir, both current terms at the time. A suffragette was a sham campaigner. Members of the WSPU, founded by Dr Pankhurst's widow, Emmeline, in 1903, chose not to take the hint. They embraced the term. Their slogan, Deeds Not Words, signified a new age of proactivity in women's politics. The WSPU was designed to stir up, rejuvenate the suffrage campaign. It developed into a far more substantial thing, an engine for change, fuelled by the conviction of its officers and members. A great deal has been said about the suffragettes and the WSPU, about how the militant campaign evolved during the next 10 years or so and how the authorities responded to it. So much so that, as I hinted at the beginning of this talk, Many people think the fight for the vote was their fight, 
and theirs alone. I do write about them in the book, of course I do, um, about the WSPU, about hunger strikers, forcible feeding, and so on. But my focus is on the non-militant uh, majority, the suffragists, because suffragists have been comparatively ignored in the past, and that's one of the reasons that I had such fun when I was researching them. It's been so exciting, so revealing to find untouched diaries, unseen letters, the keepsakes and souvenirs of a personal and political revolution. Even ordinary official documents have a certain charm, the archives and minute books of suffrage societies around the country, for example, which may sound really dull to you, but they are exciting. They're so democratic at a time when women were simply not used to democracy. And they're full of fascinating, fleeting details, like what colours look best in the light of oil lamps when you're speaking on a platform in the evening? Never wear mauve. <laughs> or where to get the bums for refreshments? It's the co-op, of course. It's in forgotten notebooks like these that one learns the tricks of the suffrage trade. If you're out campaigning, for example, and have any cardboard handy, you might think of slipping it under your bodice in case matters get out of hand and people start throwing things or manhandling you. Cardboard makes surprisingly sturdy body armour, especially if moulded to your body in the bath first, and then allowed to dry. It was certainly better than the padding material the visiting American suffragist Alice Paul used to protect herself on a march in London. According to an onlooker, her buttons tensed over the padding like hounds on a leash. I quote, when a few minutes later, under the excited gaze of an expectant crowd, the rough handling began, the buttons, strained beyond endurance, broke from their moorings in swift succession, and the padding, like the entrails of some woolly monster, emerged roll upon roll. <laughs> she must have looked rather like the Michelin tyre advertisement coming undone, for the material she had chosen for a chest protector was an unending coil of black cotton wool, wound round and round her body, times without number. And when the outside coil slackened and gave down, the rest followed, loop upon loop. The crowd was, of course, highly diverted. Ooh, look at the stuffing! When you're talking about a grand historical episode like the fight for the vote, there is a danger of treating people like caricatures, celebrities, ciphers, all the usual things. And it's easy to forget that they were real people. They were us. I heard about Phyllis Keller in a letter she wrote from prison, treasured by her family ever since. She was a suffragette, not a suffragist, so she didn't join the pilgrimage. But I want to mention her here just so that you get an idea of the diversity of people um, that were involved in the campaign. Um, and in the book. And also, it's probably important to get an idea that prison wasn't all about forcible feeding and, and misery, really. Phyllis Keller was arrested, that sounds a, a silly, uh, trite thing to say, but perhaps you'll understand. Phyllis Keller was arrested on the 5th of March 1912 for breaking the windows of arch anti-suffragist Lord Curzon. And I must just put in a word for Lord Curzon here. Today is the 100th anniversary to the day of um, the debate in the House of Lords which resulted in them voting for women's suffrage. And Lord Curzon was the main naysayer to this. And he said if women got the vote, it would be catastrophic, do incalculable harm. Um, so I'm, I'm right behind Phyllis Keller on this one, I must say. She was sent to Holloway for breaking Lord Curzon's windows. And the letter she wrote home to dearest old mum a fortnight later is teeming with news. This is just the first page. First of all, she gets practical matters out of the way. She's sending all her dirty washing home and requests some clean handkerchiefs, a nightgown and my tidy blue coat and skirt in return. There's a new rule about food inside. As long as it's not sent by post, she is allowed any amount. She'd like mum to arrange for two whole day's supplies a week, please. Make sure there's some liquid honey, a pot of marmalade, and a bottle of camp coffee essence. Potted meat is especially welcome, much better than the collapsible pieces of pie that mum sent last week. She'll manage on the prison food for the rest of the time. When she's released in a week or so, can there be a taxi waiting to collect her? She can hardly be expected to walk across London with all her bags. 
The most exciting thing that's happened to Phyllis is that Mrs Pankhurst has moved into the next cell but one. And next to Mrs Pankhurst is Dr Ethel Smythe. Mrs P is far nicer than she looks. She's ripping, writes Phyllis. <laughs> and Dr Smythe plays the organ in chapel, making the services there slightly more bearable than usual. The main trouble inside is that there's no ventilation. And when everyone is packed into the same room as they are at prayers every morning, it's impossible to breathe. And people are routinely carried out having fainted. Luckily, Dr. Garrett Anderson is also an inmate at the moment. <laughs> She's such a dear. Phyllis used to think that she would never want a lady doctor, but if there are any more like Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, then she can't think why you would ever want to be attended by a man again. I have to tell you at this point that Dr. Garrett Anderson's bedside manner was described elsewhere as brusque at best. She once emptied a, a vase of flowers over a recalcitrant patient. Uh, patient. <coughs> Phyllis tells Mum how she's spending her leisure time, of which there is admittedly a little too much. They play rounders or hockey with a rolled up sanitary towel for a ball. They're permitted to sit outside as long as they like, within reason, provided they're doing prison work. Phyllis is sewing a shirt. And then there's housework. She polishes her boots with banana skins, which works a treat, and is perfecting the art of having a bath in a pudding basin. A friend of hers has a big white Macintosh, which she spreads on her cell floor. Then she pours her scant allowance of bathing water onto it, undresses, lies down, and squirms about. <laughs> Phyllis has to content herself with trying to get clever with a nugget of sponge. No doubt Phyllis's cheerfulness was assumed in part to comfort family and friends at home, and she does seem to have been a particularly resourceful suffragette, regaling her grandson in later life with tales of how she and her friends used to go to West End restaurants, have a meal, then climb up onto the tables shouting, Votes for women! and making such a racket that they were thrown out without having to pay the bill. <laughs> but she was not alone in admitting that life in prison could have its compensations. She learned a great deal there, and the networks forged in prison were strong and far-reaching. Phyllis wrote her letter home in 1912, after years of increasing militancy on the part of the WSPU and increasing politicking on the part of the NUWSS. The tide began to turn in the spring of 1913 when NUWSS committee member Mrs Catherine Harley suggested that what was needed now to break the deadlock threatening to scupper the whole suffrage campaign and to rehabilitate its image was a grand gesture on an unprecedented scale. She had in mind a peaceful crusade a march to end all marches involving thousands of suffragists across the British Isles, ending in a mass rally in Hyde Park. Surely such a spectacular event could not fail to capture the public's imagination and convince the government that votes for women were not only desirable but inevitable. She gave the march the uplifting name of the Great Pilgrimage to suggest spirituality and unity and a sense of mission. Saturday the 26th of July 1913 was chosen as the date for the rally which would mark the climax of the pilgrimage. Working backwards from then, timetables were calculated for the six principal routes, several of which had multiple starting points. They were named the Great North Road, which included, strangely, East Anglia, the Watling Street route, which the poster in the last slide was for, and that included Wales, the West Country Route, the Portsmouth Road, the Brighton Road and the Kentish Pilgrims Way. At a meeting of the hastily formed Pilgrimage Committee on the 8th of May 1913, representatives from almost every federation of the NUWSS, there were 19, came down to London to advise the organisers on local conditions and contours, on suitable stopping places, possible overnight accommodation, including camping grounds, barns, the cheapest of cheap boarding houses. They were urged to ask their society members to consider feeding and putting up pilgrims and of course to join the pilgrimage themselves for as long or short a time as they could manage. No pressure was to be put on anyone but the expectation of practical help and financial as well as moral support was implicit. Costs were to be kept to a minimum. 
Anyone who could afford to pay their own expenses on the road was encouraged to do so. One of the aims of the pilgrimage was to raise money as well as public awareness, so there was no policy of centrally subsidising working women or busy wives and mothers. If local societies did what they could in terms of providing accommodation and food and federations fundraised for the rest, it was hoped that no one would be prevented from walking at least part of the way for lack of money. Lack of time was a different problem. As the date of the pilgrimage drew nearer, the stream of instructions from both national and local organisers swelled into a torrent. The detail included in them was remarkable. For all its spirituality, this exercise was being run like a military campaign. Every pilgrim who had signed up in advance was given a village-by-village village itinerary with all the information they could possibly need, where to stow banners in Stockport, who would be their hostesses in Cambridge, where to buy paper drinking cups at a halfpenny each in Cheshire, who was eligible to ride in a motor car and how to apply for permission to do so, and most importantly, where the ladies' lavatories were, very few and far between. No one was allowed to bring more than a single piece of luggage in addition to their regulation NUWSS knapsack. Those on the shortest route, starting from Brighton, were to set off on the 21st of July, but the longest routes, which included Carlisle and Newcastle and the Land's End route, they would take a full six weeks. That meant leaving on the 18th of June. Aristocrats marched shoulder to shoulder with colliery girls, academics with housewives, the young with the old, and men with the vast majority of women. People joined in or dropped out along the way, each wearing the suffrage colours of red, green and white and sparing as much time as possible from the ordinary round of daily life. Many stayed the whole course, walking as far as 300 miles during the six weeks from the middle of June to the end of July. They were expected to cover up to 20 miles a day and their feet swarmed with blisters. The less able rode in horse-drawn caravans like Marjorie Lee's Ark, on horseback perhaps, the occasional motor car and lots of bicycles. Everyone did what they could. I heard of one busy housewife and mother from Nottinghamshire who could afford, sadly, neither the time nor the money to join the pilgrims herself, although she would dearly love to have done so. What she did instead, for her bit, for the campaign, was to save up scraps of food for a week from the family's table. She carefully wrapped them up, and then she walked to meet the pilgrims as they passed by and presented her precious packed lunch to help keep them going. And that was how she helped to win my vote. The purpose of the Great Pilgrimage was to demonstrate to Parliament and the people how many quiet, home-loving women of Great Britain wanted enfranchisement. In other words, to prove that not every campaigner for women's suffrage was a battle axe, a rebel, or a suffragette. National and local newspaper editors were alerted well in advance and asked not only to report on the passing of the Great Pilgrimage through their region, but to publish a letter from headquarters explaining exactly what it was all about and clearly distinguishing between the law-abiding suffragists and the militant suffragettes. Some editors complied with the latter request, some didn't. Many of the audiences at the Alfresco suffrage meetings that pilgrims held, as at Tame, didn't read the paper anyway, perhaps couldn't read at all. One of the pilgrims' attackers explained that, oh yes, he saw the banners, which proclaimed them to be non-militant, but he didn't know what non meant, so he assumed they were suffragettes. Accidents and injuries were common from traffic, grumpy horses fed up of towing caravans, stumbles into potholes or heavy mud. The pilgrims' most serious problem, however, stemmed from their supposed association with the militants. Anywhere they went, they were likely to be kicked and trampled by crowds who expected them to be arsonists and stone throwers. And it's important to bear in mind that this then means that the suffragettes were getting this sort of treatment the whole time. At many places, especially in the Midlands, they were terrifyingly assaulted, receiving an unlovely artillery of mouldy vegetables, dead rats, elderly herring, rocks, cowpats, even bottles of sulfuretted hydrogen, which is a poisonous gas. Their clothes were torn from their bodies with leering insults and the filthiest obscenities threw, flew through the air like bullets. This pilgrimage was no picnic. We've already heard 
what happened to Marjorie Lees and her friends. In an attempt to counter this violent and ignorant response, the suffragists' pilgrim, uh, the pilgrims' banners were gracefully conciliatory while still attempting to rouse support with elaborately embroidered slogans like, by faith, not force, and one which I love, weaving far and weaving free, England's web of destiny. These emphasised the pilgrims' law-abiding approach. It didn't always work. When a recently discovered banner from Keswick in Cumbria was unrolled for the first time, pellets of lead shot fell from its folds, no doubt fired at the pilgrims by a furious onlooker. I'm afraid you'll have to read the book to find out what happened to Marjorie Lees after those matches were struck <laughs> in that summer night in Tame, and to share this awfully big adventure, as I have, with these pilgrims. I love that they came from so many different backgrounds, discovering strengths they never imagined they had. The further some of them had been was shopping before this, to actually walk down the length of England was amazing. And I love that they came from different backgrounds. They individually and collectively discovered so much about themselves and about their country and about the people who lived in their country. And they explored the value and the heady, heady power of solidarity which women had not had a chance to do much before then. I hope you can tell how much I enjoyed researching this book and the people I came across while writing it. A male student who joined the pilgrimage in Oxford was also delighted by the company. I have lunched with pilgrims, he said. I have teed with pilgrims. I have dined with pilgrims. And the whole time I have heard more stories that I wouldn't tell my sisters than ever before. <laughs> I've decided the story of it is like some glorious sort of post-Edwardian road movie. That's exactly what it is, actually. It lasts six weeks and climaxes in the big city. Its protagonists belong to us all. Emily Murgatroyd, for example, a mill weaver from Burnley, who was her family's main breadwinner, but thought the pilgrimage worth huge sacrifices. Young mother Gladys Duffield, nicknamed Skinny Lizzie by the others, who joined in the Lake District on impulse, leaving her young daughter with her mother-in-law and cheering everybody up when the going got tough. Alice New from Birkenhead, who rode a bicycle all the way and with her student sister Hilda was almost killed by anti-suffragists in the black country. Lady Rochdale, who by the end of the march was so hot and smelly, her words, and looked so disreputable that she was refused a room at a hotel. Young Jack from Devon, you can see him by the horse here. He drove one of the caravans and he ended up wanting to become a policeman so that he could protect the women who wanted the vote. Elderly and gloriously unfit Annie Ramsey, who's standing next to him. She'd only meant to wave her doctor daughter off on the pilgrimage when it left Land's End, but somehow she ended up walking the whole way and being called their honorary mother by all the other pilgrims, and so on. These are our homely, passionate great-grandmothers, our eccentric great-aunts, ladies, lads and dads and workers and women, everyday people doing a really extraordinary thing. When asked by someone what bound them together, one of the pilgrims gave an inspired answer. We are representatives, she said, of every woman. I quote, representatives of homemakers, wives and mothers, who feel so intensely the disabilities under which they suffer from man-made laws and yet are unable to come out and fight for their own enfranchisement. We are just the comparative few who've had the nerve and strength to leave their homes and endure a few weeks of hardship in order to help their less fortunate sisters, women old and young, drawn from all ranks of life and yet bound together by a common tie of sisterhood powerful enough to break down all differences in age and social standing, mothers and daughters as true comrades, peeresses and mill hands as real friends, all stepping out together to convert England. And that's what they did. The Great War intervened, but I have no doubt that the success of the Great Pilgrimage did more to win women the vote than any other single element of the suffrage campaign. After witnessing it, even Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, no friend of women's suffrage, 
was forced to confess that he was struck by the suffragists' dignity and powers of persuasion and stamina at a time when the unpopular militant suffragette campaign was at its height. And when asked afterwards by one of the pilgrims whether he would now admit that women had finally won the right to be called people in a legal sense and therefore to vote under the terms of a representation of the People Act, he is said to reply, albeit slightly doubtfully, that yes, he supposed women were people after all. <laughs> the NUWSS leader, Mrs Fawcett, a part-time pilgrim herself, she was beside herself with joy when the representation of the People Act received royal assent on the 6th of February 1918. We've won, she sobbed, laughing. We've won. So what was their legacy, these steadfast mothers of our democracy? It's said that Mahatma Gandhi was inspired by Mrs Fawcett and her campaign when he first embraced passive resistance in 1907, going on himself, of course, to inspire millions of others. Suffragist processions became the pattern for countless peaceful demonstrations on the streets of our towns and cities in this country and abroad. The pilgrimage foreshadowed a much more famous occasion, perhaps unjustly so, when 200 men marched from Jarrow to London in October 1936. The women of Green and Common enjoyed the same sort of dedicated sisterhood as the pilgrims did, any one of whom might stand as a role model today. I think of those women wearing black the other night at the Golden Globes. It somehow seems to me to be the same spirit. The Great Pilgrimage is at the root of our flourishing tradition of peaceful mass protest and at its heart. The Great Pilgrimage was the suffragists' answer to both the fanaticism of the militants, the perceived fanaticism of the militants, and their own perceived lack of heroism. A statement of belief in the power of ordinary women and their ability when working together to turn the world upside down without violence or hatred. It was dangerous, difficult, physically and emotionally challenging. It broke every rule in the book about how Edwardian females of every class were supposed to behave. But it was glorious too. A peaceful fight against low expectation, low self-esteem, constant stereotyping and the spurious comfort of the status quo. And perhaps unlike the suffragettes, the suffragists had faith that victory was assured as long as they walked calmly and purposefully to claim it, rather than charging at it in fury. They were optimists, confident that the strength of spirit embodied by the pilgrims and their supporters would prove irresistible to the government, that this time their voices would not only be heard, but understood. We can't give them and their militant sisters much in return for their efforts, except a promise to use the vote they fought so hard to win and wherever it's necessary, to keep on fighting. Thank you. So, uh, many thanks for that uh, really uh, inspiring and interesting talk. So, uh, now we have... Uh, about 35 minutes uh, for discussion. So uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, just uh, put up your hand and uh, we'll start. So, David. Can I just say, I'm so delighted. So I used to work at the Boards of Library. I, I, uh, I'm delighted to have somebody at long last getting this very important event on the record and in, in a form available to people outside academia. And thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. I must Sorry. say, I, I was delighted when I first came across it, and I could not believe that it was not already firmly in the public consciousness. Okay. Uh, right, so we've got roving mics, so uh, there's two at the back there, so you can. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, a couple of years ago, read a book about Savia Dalip Singh, um, the descendant of Maharaja Dalip Singh, and it was really exciting to find out about someone that 
I um, hadn't really been taught about in history. And obviously your book explores um, the suffragists who, you know, maybe we weren't taught about so much or we don't know about. What was it like for you to research and learn about the people who were maybe been pushed to the back of public consciousness regarding votes for women? Um, I think you've virtually summed up my writing career, actually, in writing about people who've been pushed to the back of public consciousness. Um, it, it, was a, it was a gift for me because um, the fact that it was the majority of campaigners really gives it um, some potency, I think, this story. Um, I usually, when I write my books, like to interview people. I use oral history a lot. So for my previous book, In the Family Way, I did loads of interviews with women who had had illegitimate children before the 60s or who were illegitimate themselves. Um, not so easy in this case to, to be um, interviewing people, but I did talk to descendants, and that's always thrilling to talk to somebody whose grandmother for example, was there on the pilgrimage. And you probably won't remember, but I mentioned somebody called Gladys Duffield, Skinny Lizzie, and I spoke to her granddaughter, and she said, oh, Granny used to go on forever about the pilgrimage. And I said, tell me, tell me. And she had the little sketch map that, that she'd drawn out, and, and apparently she was so proud of going on the pilgrimage, as she should have been. And it made me even more determined to get the story out there, because we should be so proud of these people. So... Sorry, that's rather rambling, but the short answer to your question is extremely gratifying. Okay, I think there was somebody else that was asked. Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Did you want to wait for the mic? No, I'm going to leave it. I find the microphone's a bit scary. <laughs> um, just what you were saying, I met a man who was um, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst. Godson, and that was, and I just wanted to be like, can I touch you? Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about um, the women's responses to violence, because as you say, you know, there was no kind of distinction in the public mind between suffragists and suffragettes. Yeah. And obviously, this was a time when um, kind of w NUWSS policy was moving away from militancy and distancing themselves from the kind of more extreme window smashing. And yet, I suppose, being on the receiving end of some of what the suffragettes would have experienced, I just wondered if you'd come, come across personal testimony that might illuminate how they'd responded to it and whether that increased their sympathy when before they might have kind of seen them as, you know, uh, you know had that kind of idea of them as hooligans. What yeah. did you kind of... On a personal level, I, I found several people who really sympathised with the, with the suffragettes um, after violent episodes like the one in Tame. But it's, it's a measure of the pilgrims that at Tame, for example, and various other places where they received very violent um, receptions, after, after the violence at night, um, they went back and they climbed back on the platform the next morning and they said, look, we're still here. Will you listen to us now? And usually people did. And in fact, I think they were applauded out of Tame when, when they left. Um, so they had a very pragmatic but courageous attitude to, to violence that, you know, that they didn't sit and nurse their wounds and say, gosh, those, you know, we, we really feel for the suffragettes. They, they made something constructive out of it, um, which I found quite moving, actually. Hello, Jane. You've done it again. Hello, well done. <laughs> um, have you unearthed any oral interviews or film uh, footage of, of this uh, Yeah, event. there are some lovely snatches of film footage which, which are accessible to, to you all. I've put references in the book. So we've got Emily Wilding Davis's um, funeral procession, which is extraordinary. It's there, playing out in front of us. Um, you can see footage of Emily Wilding Davidson, um, you know, at, at the race course and, and things. It's, it's incredibly immediate. Um, I was absolutely spellbound. So do, do if, if you get the book of, or borrow it. Of the actual it, look pilgrimage the itself? Of the pilgrimage itself, no. Sadly not. Lots of newspaper um, things. And I had the mortifying experience of... Um, I'm, I'm very proud to be the granddaughter of a, print, a local printer and journalist, and, and it goes back for generations. I've got printer's ink in my veins. Um, and I thought, oh, I know. I'll look up grandpa's um, or great-grandpa's paper in Sleaford in Lincolnshire. And I thought, he's bound to be, you know, I'll feel really good when I've done this. And there was this tirade against the suffragists. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and I, I felt quite confused after that. Um, so lots and lots of newspaper coverage, but no, I haven't 
come across any film coverage, but maybe somebody else has or will. Thanks for a fantastic talk. Did you come across material on how the suffragettes responded to the suffragists' pilgrimage? Were they critical? Did some individuals offer their own support? Um, uh, be interested to hear. Yes. Um, again, on a personal level, there, there was support. And sometimes when the pilgrimage got to a place that was particularly hostile, then suffragettes would step in and um, either physically take them to their houses to, to shelter them from from what was going on. Um, but on a sort of policy level, less sympathy. And that the suffragettes always seem to be exasperated um, at this stage by, by the suffragists. Um, but once you get down to the, you know, to the personal level, not just the suffragettes, but the anti-suffragists actually had, had um, some sympathy for the way that these women were being treated. And there's one, I can't remember where it is now, but there's one episode where um, a very nice anti-suffragist gentleman, which is how it's described in, in the diary that I was using at the time, actually took um, a group of people out of their caravan, which was being pelted with boulders and rocks, took them home, gave them a hot bath, um, and then sent them out again with a nice hot breakfast the next morning to carry on. And I think that's one thing that the pilgrimage really brought home to me, that, that they could communicate on a personal level. That's what it was all about. It was about stopping somewhere and talking to the people there. And, and really helping them to understand. And it's that personal element of communication which really shines through the whole thing. Um, follows on from the question about the footage. Um, when is the film going to be made and will Hollywood be buying it? <laughs> you tell me. Would anybody like to tell me? <laughs> it's an um, uh, inappropriate um, metaphor, but I've missed the boat, I think, with that one, because, um, although I suppose it's 1913, so we're not tied to, to, the, um, to the date of, of, of 2018, but it would make a fantastic film, because it, there's such different backgrounds, these women, and, and they started off rather sort of stiff and, and shy, and they ended up, they didn't want to leave each other when, when it got to London, and there was a big rally on the Saturday when they arrived in London, and then there was a massive party on the Saturday night, and then a church service on the Sunday, which they went to. Um, but then there were tears, and because the, they didn't want to leave each other afterwards. Um, the, the camaraderie is so strong. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the colours of the suffragists, because I'd always thought the suffragettes, joke suffragists, were purple, green and white. And because we only ever see black and white photos, <laughs> this is news to me that this red was coming into it. So. What, you know, how, how were the colours decided, or when did the suffragettes go purple, or what was that? Well, the suffragettes were, were started off in 1903. I think Elizabeth Crawford, who, who is the absolute expert on everything suffrage, if you, if you read her work, you will learn that all the different suffrage societies had different colours. Um, <laughs> you see, we're looking usually at black and white images, aren't we, of protesters, so how are we to know what colour their sashes are? Um, but the predominant colour, because the predominant campaigners were the, the red and the green and the, and the white. Um, so I've only heard about um, suffragist movements in the UK and in England. Did anything similar happen anywhere else? There was a lot of activity going on in the States at this time. And Alice Paul, the, the lady whose stuffing came out, um, she, she was um, a great mover and shaker. Um, I think she was part of the organizing, um, I don't know if it's a committee, but part, part of the organizing people who got the suffrage um, marches going in Washington, D.C. in 1913. Um, yeah, there was a lot of things going on elsewhere. And, of course, many places got the vote before we did in the U.K. Um, for women. And in the States, it was, it was state by state. Um, but the Scandinavian countries... Um, Got the date, got the vote before we did. And New Zealand. And New Zealand, of course, <laughs> New Zealand. Yes, in 1893. Yeah. So another one there. Uh, were the suffragists and suffragettes divided purely on um, method, or was it also on demographics? So were there differences in class and race and, and that kind of thing as well? 
to me, uh, by, by my research, it doesn't seem to have been um, a demographic division. That there were very, very, very many working class um, suffragists um, and even working class suffragist organisers. Um, there's one in the book called Selina Cooper who is fantastic. Apparently she was a mesmerising speaker. But I've transcribed some of her diary as it is in the book and you can hardly tell what she's saying. Uh, her spelling is absolutely atrocious. And her punctuation is, is worryingly bad because she talks about sleeping the night in the same bed as Lloyd George and it sort of goes on and you suddenly think, what? What's she doing? But it, it's, um, it's, it's pan pan-demographic, if there is such a word, uh, the suffragists. I don't know if I'm right in assuming that perhaps the majority of suffragettes were upper class. Is that right, Elizabeth, do you think, or not? No. So, so they were equally... Yeah, equally divided. Over there in the, in the red... Thanks. Um, did the, was there a feeling that the march had achieved what it set out to achieve? I was just wondering if they felt a bit of kind of anticlimax afterwards. No, I think they did feel that it had set out um, to achieve what they wanted it to achieve, but then the war got in the way. Um, and as Anne was explaining right at the beginning, the popular um, misconception is that, is that we were given the vote as a reward for what we'd done during the war. But I think we would not have been able I say we, but you know what I mean. Um, we wouldn't have been so able to take so many positions of responsibility um, and high achievement during the war had we not had this um, suffrage heritage behind us. So it, it was all a progression. And, you know, if it hadn't been for the war, then we would have got the vote much sooner. So it was seen as a huge success. A question at the front here. I think you might, you we might need, need the mic. to wait for the mic, yes. <laughs> Could you tell me a bit more about how the suffragettes were received um, upon coming back home from the, um, the pilgrimage in their localities and in their communities? Was it all excitement and pride or had there been you know, criticism or ill will within the, within the family? Yeah, and that's, so that's that a good question. There were family tensions sometimes. Um, you can imagine if somebody like Emily Murgatroyd, who, who I mentioned, who was a mill worker, she was the breadwinner for the family and yet she elected to leave for six weeks. And there would be no um, guarantee that you get your job back when you came back. So, you know, it was somebody like her sacrifice, personal sacrifice, but she was expecting, I'm not saying Emily was, but people like her were expecting the, the family to take that sacrifice as well. Um, and sometimes there were tensions between husbands and wives. Um, but sometimes there was fierce pride, huge pride. Um, Again, Gladys Duffield that, that I mentioned, she left her daughter with, with her mother-in-law. Her husband was actually in India at the time, and she should really have asked him for permission. So she wrote the letter, knowing full well it would take weeks for the letter to get to <laughs> India, and even more weeks for the letter to get back. And apparently he wrote back and said, well, I thought you'd be in prison, but no, she, she was fine. So, um, yeah, mixed, mixed reception. But I think most people were proud. And a lot of the people on the pilgrimage had been working already for decades in the suffrage campaign. So it wasn't as though it was unexpected. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jane, thank you. Barbara. Um, they all seem such, such angels. Uh, but I was, um, I received an inquiry at the Alpine Club Library, uh, with a surname only, wanting to find out about a woman who was a member of the Ladies' Alpine Club, founded 1907. I couldn't find her anywhere until I started looking in Times Court Records, <laughs> and it seems she was one of the violent, most violent of any, whether she was a confirmed suffragette or not, I don't know. But I got the feeling that she might not have been the only one who joined the suffragettes simply because she was a born troublemaker. <laughs> um, and um, every time she was led out of Holloway, she'd um, scarp her off to Ireland um, and, then, and, then, um, and then sneak back into the country and then go break someone else's window. 
Um, I suppose this is in, in between, you know, climbing in the, in the Lake District or Scotland or whatever she was yeah. doing. But were there other confirmed troublemakers? Well, it's difficult to tell, isn't it? But, I mean, we wouldn't have got anywhere without confirmed troublemakers. <laughs> we, we needed confirmed troublemakers. And it's difficult to tell what their motives were. But certainly that the campaign fired up imaginations like nobody's business. Um, and, and it was extraordinary that women having had their imaginations fired up, could then translate that into action, whether it was militant or non-militant. Um, I still find it really, really exciting. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, for a wonderful talk about something that's not enough has been known about. I just wonder what happened afterwards. Those who'd gone in caravans and on bicycles presumably had to turn around and take the caravans and bicycles back. They put them on the train from London before the party started on the Saturday night. So, so well the horses the and the caravans, yeah, went, went on to, to the goods wagons and, and disappeared back to um, where they came from. Um, and Marjorie Lees, um, whom you saw with the caravan, just talking about what happened next. It makes me very sad to realise that she didn't get the vote in, um, in 1918 because she hadn't been to university. She was old enough, but she lived at home with her mother, so she didn't own property. So she was not qualified to vote after all that. But she carried on working for universal suffrage, which of course came in 1928. Thank you. Jane, congratulations uh, on another magnificent piece of social history archaeology. Um, this has partly been answered already, but I'm just very interested in what happened after the march and the process that took place um, and how it was all muddled up with the First World War because I, you were saying that the, the act finally went through in, in January 1918 before the war ended. Um, what was the actual process? I mean, what happened next to take the process on towards the, the finalization of the act? Well, immediately after the pilgrimage, there was still sort of political bickering going on. Um, and the government had a lot to deal with. I mean, there was Irish home rule going on as well. So, so divided attentions, to say the least. And then the war came, and both the WSPU and the NUWSS said, all right, we're not going to campaign for, for women's votes during the war. We're going to do what we can for the country. And a lot of suffragists um, joined what was called the Scottish Women's Hospitals Unit, um, which you didn't have to be Scottish. It's, that's, that's, it was just founded by um, a Scottish woman. Um, went off to work in women-only hospitals, um, so women surgeons, women orderlies, women x-ray technicians, everything. Um, a lot of suffragists did that, but there was always the undercurrent of things, and, and whenever a little glimpse of light was seen, then a little deputation would be sent, perhaps, to government. So, so the engine was kept idling, if you like, um, during the war. Um, and then it all happened pretty quickly at the end of the war, partly because there had to be new legislation, because before then, you, th there was a residency um, clause that meant that you had to have lived in the country for a certain period of time before you could vote. But there were men out fighting for their country, you know, for, for a year, for two years. So how were we going to manage that? So they, it had to be redesigned, and that's when the women managed to sort of get in the door. Um, as it's centenary year, <coughs> um, I found it quite moving you talking about the solidarity among the women, and it was nice to see that picture of the women's march there. Mm. Um, I wonder what message you think your book has for women now, 100 years later, and what hopes you have for the centenary year yourself for women? I think what I have learned from this is that, <laughs> it's going to sound very corny this, but I really, really truly believe it, that you just have to put one foot in front of the other sometimes, and then the next one, and then the next one. And you do it together, and you do it till you get to the end. Um, and, and it's this shared simplicity of statement, really, that, that is the most powerful. Um, and, and I think that sense of sisterhood and solidarity, and I'm not saying sisterhood in an exclusive sense, because, I mean, there were loads of men on, on the Women's March last year. Um, but that, that sense of, of unity, solidarity, and 
just doing something not better than your neighbour, but just doing it together, even if that is just putting one foot in front of the other. It's, it's really exciting. And that's what voting is. And, you know, all you're doing is one person putting something in a box. But so are thousands and millions of others, and, and that's what makes it so powerful. Um, I've expressed that extremely badly, but, but maybe you just get a sense of, of how I feel about that. Thank you, Jen. That was a great talk. Um, we, we touch on um, classes, but I, I'm interested in something which is race. Were there other women uh, within the pilgrimage other than white uh, women? I haven't come across any pilgrims, uh, certainly within the suffrage campaign, um, but I haven't yet perhaps come across any pilgrims, and I wish I had. Um, but certainly within the suffrage campaign, there were. Um, and there must have been on the pilgrimage, but, but I have to go from the few, you know, the, the newspaper pictures that I have. Um, no one really talked about it. That's why I was curious to know whether... Yeah. With your research. I mean, when, when reporters are, are reporting it, they're, they're not going to say um, what, what the, you know, the, the racial origin of the, of the pilgrims is. Um, I can go by names, but, but that's all. Sadly. Work to be done on that. And question just behind. <coughs> Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, picking up on your point about one step in front of the another, um, what comes across is a wonderful feeling of democracy at work, even if they weren't voting, um, because it's this diverse group um, coming together. Can you say something about, as it were, the logistics of that? How in that time did people who weren't previously organized to collaborate come together? Well, actually, they were previously organized to collaborate because the NUWSS was very tightly organized and the networks were, were very strategic and you had your federations and, and, they, and they branched out to even village societies, town societies, federation, and then down, down to, the, to the center. So there was already in place a huge network. But how they communicated along the, the lines of that network so thoroughly, I, it just fills me with awe. I suppose there were several postal deliveries a day, weren't there? Um, but it, it was a fantastic feat. It really was an amazing feat of organization. And that was part of their argument. Um, you know, they were saying, we can be organized, we are responsible, um, we can take responsibility, and we can work constructively. Give us a vote. Oh, this one, lady over here. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm curious about the idea of the pilgrimage itself, that idea of a, of a pilgrimage as a political statement or, or a protest statement. How, how novel an idea was that in itself? Was, was, it, was there a recent precedent? And, and sort of where did the idea come from? As far as I know, there, there wasn't um, a precedent. There have been lots and lots of protest marches and demonstrations, um, mostly in London. Um, but I, I'm, I may well be proved wrong, and, and please prove me wrong if you can, but as far as I know, that there was nothing. So, so you think this is sort of the origin of this idea of a, of a yeah. you know, political yeah. pilgrimage? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think that's, that's the sort of thing that Catherine Harley was, was thinking of certainly, when she organized it, but, but no, no close precedent, you know, as part of the campaign. Question at the front down here. Uh, in the red. Oh, yeah. Suitably in the red. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, yes, I dressed in red especially. Jane, thank you so much. That was really, really great. Um, and I've enjoyed reading the book and had thank the privilege you. of reading it beforehand as well. Um, People are talking about precedents and relationships, and it's just set up various thing, thinking in my mind. Um, the Chartists mm. were surely a great example, with the yeah. great meeting on Kennington Common in the 1840s, um, and the, the huge petition that, that they presented to Parliament then. So there was a tradition, but of course, although they had been peaceable, um, they were not treated peaceably. 
Yes. Like the, 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 the Peterloo massacre would be another example. Indeed. Of yeah. something like that. Yeah. So I think there were uh, precedents for that sort of organization. But one of the other things that really interests me about your women is what other things they had done in their lives because there was a vast network of charities and local organizations, usually organized by women, mm -hmm. um, which must have given them a lot of experience. Yes. Um, and of course, they had by that time the right to be local councillors uh, and various other, hold various other political offices. So it would be very interesting to, to, to examine some of the questions people have been raising um, about what the origins were, how they got the ideas they did, where, where their uh, powers of organization came from. Yes, I, I think that, that would be a wonderful thing for, for somebody to research thoroughly. Um, and you come across, or I came across names of pilgrims after the pilgrimage, after the vote, still doing extraordinary things in terms of social welfare um, and political advancement, not just for women. Um, but, but again, that was, that was the point, that they wanted the vote so that they could make society better, not, not so that they could make women's part in it better, necessarily. It's sort of slightly redundant because as, when this lady behind me started speaking, I was just thinking about when you said you looked at lots of minutes of the societies and everything, and I'd wondered if you'd come across that meeting where somebody had had the idea why don't we go have a, a pilgrimage? Or, mm. Oh, yes, there. yes. Ka Ka Catherine Harley came, yeah, right. came, so came up with the idea. Oh, well, yes. So we did yeah. have those yeah. moments. When um, the yeah, you, you have the date, and it was two months before it set off. Wow. That was, that was so great. the whole thing was, was conceived and organised in two months. Wow. And do you think we could do something like that today? Women could get organised and, and should do something like of that? Course given, course. Yeah. given all the things that, you know. <laughs> Lots of people have been given, suggesting given it. Given the pay issues and, yeah. you know. Well, Lots of people have been suggesting it. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Let's look out for that one then. Yep. <laughs> we probably need to so, um, uh, I'm going to ask you in a minute to uh, join me in, in thanking Jane for this really interesting both talk and, and discussion. But I just want to kind of uh, point you forward to the next event in the series, um, which is on Thursday, the 25th of January. Um, and it's um, Rachel Polsky, who's a blue badge guide, who runs the Go London tours. And she's doing a talk about Women's London, a guide to great lives. So it's kind of talking about the, um, the various sites and statues and the buildings associated with, um, with, with sort of famous and uh, not so famous women in London. So that's uh, Thursday the 25th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, so those of you who have very much in, uh, yes, uh, no, where is it? Uh, it's in the Wolfson Theatre of the new academic building. I mean, you'll be able to get the details on the website, obviously, of, uh, of LSE, but just to point you forward to those of you who've enjoyed this evening, and I'm sure all of you have, uh, that's the next event. So can I now just, uh, just thank you very much, thank Jane, you. for starting us with such a, Many such a wonderful talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs>